Well, welcome once again to Art Break, everyone. It's always nice to see you come in person to these events. It's very much appreciated. Um, well, when Raisin in the Sun debuted on Broadway in 1959, uh, it marked, it was a real turning point in not only American theater, but American culture. Uh, to begin with, it uh, was the first play to reach Broadway written by a black woman. And uh, its author, Lorraine Hansberry, was also the youngest uh, playwright to um, uh, achieve that as well. But the real significance uh, in the play is that it uh, became a real breakthrough um, in that it, uh, for the first time, offered a realistic presentation of Black lives uh, through fully developed characters and in nuanced ways showed the thoughts and emotions behind their actions and decisions. And this, of course, is contrary to all the racial stereotypes that existed to them. So the play has really become kind of an iconic representation um, today and has relevance as much now as it did when it opened. But we're very fortunate to have with us Anthony Hamilton, who recently directed uh, a production of Raisin at the Civic Theater. Uh, Anthony is a director and award-winning choreographer as well. And since 1911, he's directed numerous other projects, um, productions at the Civic, and was recently appointed to the Cin Civic's interim artistic director. And he is also um, currently a visiting professor of theater arts at Kalamazoo College. So today he's really offering us an opportunity to explore the thematic dimensions of the play, uh, its cultural relevance, both past and present, and the circumstances under which it was created, as well as insights to its remarkable author, Lorraine Hansberry. So please welcome Anthony Hamilton. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. I'd first like to start with a few acknowledgements, um, first of which is Dr. Miriam Thomas. Thank you so much for reaching out and asking me to be a part of this. I greatly appreciate it. Round of applause for Dr. Thomas. There are some uh, friendly faces in the room. I would be remiss not to mention them. Uh, Laura Livingstone McNellis and Lanny Potts, my K College family, thank you for being here. Executive Director of the Kalamazoo City Theater, Laura Zervik, is in attendance. Thank you for being here. And uh, in a little while, I'm going to turn Mary Redmond loose. She is the director of Clybourne Park, which is currently running across the street on uh, the auditorium main stage. So thank you for being here as well, Mary. So I know this setup seems like, you know, for the next hour, I'm going to lecture you about a raisin in the sun. And there may be elements of that. But what I'm really looking forward to over the course of this hour is a conversation uh, about this woman, Lorraine Hansberry, about this great dramatic work, a raisin in the sun. And so I'm going to be asking you for some feedback about what this show has meant to you, whether it was the movie the first time you saw it in 1961 whether it has been staged adaptations, such as the one we just presented. We just closed, actually, A Raisin in the Sun on the Civic Stage, January 22nd. So it was an amazing, I actually have a cast member who played Carl Lindner in attendance, Mr. Ron Dundon. So although the show has closed, I did bring a little program in case any of you missed it. That's actually gonna be my first question to the group. How many of you had the opportunity to see a raisin in the sun across the street. Wow, it's a lot of people. Excellent. So I'm interested in your feedback. I would like to have a discussion about that production in, in particular. Um, I'm very grateful to, to Laura and to Tony Humerkauser, the former artistic director of the Civic, for making this show, bringing it back. The Civic was the first to do it in 1961, the first community theater in the nation to do it while it was still running on Broadway and in Chicago. 
So I thank them for their leadership and wanting to bring that back. Um, so of the hands that were raised, I would just like maybe one or two people to share with me what your reaction to the piece was and any background that you had coming into it. Don't be shy. And there is a mic available if you need amplification. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, as a child, I lived in South Chicago. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and my background is sort of in and out of Chicago, so I understand very much what was going on in the play. Mm -hmm. And I think he did a marvelous job. I, I mean, the acting was just so convincing, really wonderful. But I also love the August Wilson that you did the year before. Yes. And I've seen August Wilson plays in, in Chicago and also in New York City. So congratulations. I hope you do more. Thank you. Many more. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. A Raisin in the Sun, um, admittedly, is my favorite play ever written. However, August Wilson is my favorite playwright. So take that as you will. Um, I love this piece. Thank you for those words. I first saw A Raisin in the Sun behind us at the Parish Theater in 2004. It was a production directed by Robert L. Smith. Does anyone remember Bob Smith? Yeah, a few people. Yes, a great friend, a great mentor. He assembled a wonderful cast of community members. And I was a teenager at the time. I had never seen even the movie A Raisin in the Sun at that point. And so when that show started, and for those three hours that I sat in the back of that theater, I thought to myself, wow, there is a place for me in this narrative, in the narrative of the American theater. And I had never seen that, had been performing for years, but A Raisin in the Sun was my beginning to understanding that I could do what it is I'm doing now. So I'm very thankful to Bob Smith, may he rest in peace. And I'm very happy that the Civic again celebrated that show for uh, the Centennial production. Very good. Any other comments about what you may have witnessed a couple of weeks ago, Deb? Um, <laughs> I went to the show thinking it might feel dated, and it absolutely did not. It was so totally relevant to what I, not personally, but what I see experiencing today. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I'm glad that uh, so they put that play on again because of its relevance. Yes. And the actors were fantastic, um, well, well cast. And thank you for uh, putting on the play, directing the play. Excellent. Let's talk a little bit about the given circumstances of the play, the time period in which it is set. 1959, Southside Chicago. How many people are around <laughs> during that era? And remember, what was happening politically, socially. Um, let's speak to that for a moment. What was going on at the cusp of, of the beginning of the 60s? In 1959, what was happening in our nation at that time when Lorraine was producing this play for the first time on Broadway? Jim Crow. Jim Crow. Yeah, Ron, what is that? Well, following the, uh, the end of World War II, the, when Black soldiers came back, they were greeted by a bunch of Southern governors who said, no, you're not going to attain first class status in my state. Mm -hmm. And we're going to make sure you don't by enacting laws that restricted voting, enacting laws that restricted uh, access to various things in society, uh, going to a lunch counter or whatever. And as a result, the, the fact that African Americans were second class citizens was reinforced mm -hmm. over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And they finally had enough of that and said, it's time we stand up. And that's when Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement came about in the 60s. And thankfully, things started to change. Yes, there's this notion sometimes that because we're um, in the North or we're in the Midwest, that maybe we escaped some of those injustices. But that's not the truth. Um, there was a lot, I mean, Chicago is still today one of the most racially segregated cities in the nation. 
So it's interesting that Lorraine took a peek at injustice happening in the North. We're coming out of the Great Migration, the second wave of the Great Migration, in which many, many people of color moved from the South to the North in droves, and they faced injustice just like they did in the South, including lynchings, including burning of, of houses or, or the, the cross in the front yard. I mean, all of that stuff happened in the North as well. And one of the things about Lorraine Hansberry is she was a great playwright, a great dramatist, but she was also a revolutionary. This was not someone who was uh, coy in, in her opinions and her thoughts about the world we live in. She came from a very, very, very um, astute Black family at the time. Her father, Carl, was a real estate entrepreneur on the south side of Chicago. He would flip units and make them smaller units, and it would help to house Black families. The term redlining, who knows what that is or what it refers to? Mary? Redlining is uh, the real estate agents going into the community and starting to talk about as soon as a Black family wanted to purchase or had purchased, the realtors would say, you know, you're going to lose all your property value, so you need to sell. No for sale signs allowed. Mm. So it was all done without the block's knowledge mm -hmm. that somebody might be selling to a Black family, and then it continued. And that's what happens in A Raisin in the Sun. There were these uh, covenants, they were called private covenants, in certain neighborhoods that said, you know, we'll only sell our property to white people. And in A Raisin in the Sun, we have uh, Ron's character, Carl Lindner, coming in, approaching this Black family saying, hey, uh, you kind of slipped through the cracks here, and uh, we want to we wanna relook at this. We'll buy the house back from you to keep our neighborhood pure, if you will. So a red lining is, has deep roots in Chicago, but it's all over the place. Thank you, Mary. Other thoughts about red lining, Lanny? Uh, yes, uh, this, the issue of red lining is still clearly visible in the city of Kalamazoo. Yeah. So you can look at a red lining map from can't remember if it's from the 20s or the 30s, but it's online, it's available, you can see it. And the, the poverty on the other side mm -hmm. of those areas exists today exactly as it existed in the 1930s. It is not any different. It's, it's frightening. Yes, Lorraine Hansberry was actually born in 1930, I believe May 19th of uh, 1930. And her father was very famous for a legal case. Does anyone know what legal case? A uh, landmark legal case, as a matter of fact. Anyone familiar with it? Went all the way to the Supreme Court in 1940. So Lorraine was around 10 years old at the time. It's Hansberry versus Lee. The Hansberry being Carl Augustus uh, Hansberry, Lorraine's father who was, again, her mother was a teacher and a ward for the Republican Party in, in Chicago. She really came from great stock. Her family really uh, ingrained in the children because there were three other siblings, this sense of racial pride. You do well so that we all appear to do well. And so Lorraine has a lot of elements of that in A Raisin in the Sun, this sense of racial pride, the sense of upholding the race. You can see a lot of that in the character of Lena and how she talks about her late husband, Walter Sr. So there's a lot. But talk about the timelessness of A Raisin in the Sun. There's so many themes yet prevalent. There's so many things we're facing today from in, in equities and uh, pay, gender, abortion. I mean, there's so much stuff that is still timeless um, and included in this work. I see you, Laura. Oh, I was going to say, um, circling back to what you were asking before about was going on in, in the late 50s, early 60s in terms of our country and um, Jim Crow laws, but also the you know rise of feminism is just starting to take off. And that's one of the things I just love about this too is that um, Lorraine Hansberry was the revolutionary, as you say, and um, she stepped forward in a way that no other woman, black woman had, but many, very few other women in general, so she was revolutionary in that respect. And then um, Lena, too, is taking charge in a way that a lot of women had not 
at least not <laughs> publicly mm -hmm. um, been depicted as doing. And so I think that's kind of interesting as well. Yes, definitely. I say Lorraine was a revolutionary because, I mean, A Raisin in the Sun actually comes off a bit more palatable than some of her political views personally, but she was a queer woman. There's this book, actually. The cast of A Raisin in the Sun gifted me this book. They all signed it, and I'm about halfway through. It gives you a glimpse at the life of the woman. We have this great work. It will last and last and last because it is timeless, because it does speak to yesterday, today, but this book really gives you a glimpse at her childhood, um, her parents, what she, what was expected of her and her siblings. They were all successful. And it gets into, she was married uh, for a decade to a Jewish man, but it gets, really, it gets into her personal life. And there's very few sources like this to tell the story of, of the woman. We lost Lorraine Hansberry at the age of 34. She was a heavy smoker, heavy drinker, and it took her away from us early. But the brilliance that she possessed is left in the A Raisin in the Sun. Uh, in New York City right now, there's production of the sign in Sidney Bernstein's window, which is a not uh, very, re uh, not very, what do I want to say? It's not done frequently. It is being done recently. That's what I was getting mixed up. Uh, it's being presented in Brooklyn, and I didn't get a chance to see it when I was there last week, but it's very exciting that that is being done because we don't hear about her other works. To Be Young, Gifted, and Black is another work, uh, Le Blanc. She had other things that, that have been produced here and there since she's been gone. But why is Raisin the piece that stands out from this woman? Let's explore the timeless themes that are included in this piece. What are some of the themes that are prevalent in this work? that we can explore for a few minutes. Ron. One of the things that struck me in watching the cast perform this show, I was only in a couple of scenes, was Walter's speech when he finds out uh, that the money's all been, uh, that he gave to uh, Willie is gone. Mm -hmm. And that amounts to $6,500 out of the 10,000 that they got as a life insurance payment. Yes. And one of the, the speeches that he has, he talks about the takers and the took it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's as relevant today as it was when she wrote it. Mm -hmm. Because we see this huge amount of wealth concentrated at the top mm -hmm. and almost none at the bottom. Yeah. And that in, uh, incongruency of, of wealth is, in, is incredible. And that's what Walter was talking about. Yes. We have the takers, we have the took them. And what Walter is bemoaning is this lack of his access to the American dream. He wants to secure financial security for his family in the same way that he sees counterparts, white counterparts of his age doing in Chicago. He works as a chauffeur and he talks, he discusses in the play about how he sees these white boys at the table making deals worth millions of dollars, and he's not in on, on that world. So his lack of access to the American dream does what to him? What, what is it that, that happens when access is denied? What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? That's the Langston Hughes poem, Harlem. And that question, does it explode? I think is, is specifically relevant to the character of Walter Lee because he feels like he has very little to offer his family uh, as the now man of the house having lost his father recently. So he is that. Raisin in the Sun, if you will. I think Lorraine wrote it that way. There's some discrepancy sometimes about whose show is this? Is it Walter's show or is it Lena's show? And I think it's safe to say that Walter is the protagonist of the story. He is the one who we should be rooting for. And in the moment with Lindner at the end, he comes into his own. The, the script says he came into manhood today because he's finally able to stand up and say, we will not take your money 
as a way of you saying that we're not fit to walk the earth, which is another line that Lena says. So Walter is definitely, I, I believe it's his show, but let's discuss the women who are around him. That's mama, that's his wife, that's his sister and their significance to the story in A Raisin in the Sun and black women's significance in, in our struggle as a people for hundreds of years in this country. Any thoughts about that? Oh, yes, Mary. The first thing I will say is that if ever there was maternal instinct come to life, on a stage, part of it is Lena, because she she's a gatherer. She wants to keep her family together. She wants her son to give up this idea of investing in a liquor store mm -hmm. and to celebrate the fact that he's a working black man. Mm -hmm. And what strikes me the most is the ambition that Benny has about becoming a doctor. Mm -hmm. the, there were no small goals for Benny, who was young enough to be totally aware of how they were treated. Mm -hmm. And what struck me the most about the production is the relationship between Lena and Ruth. Mm -hmm. Because even though Ruth is her daughter-in-law, Lena just loves her like a daughter. She's a good mother-in-law because she keeps her mouth shut when they're fighting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I just, I, I saw a lot of the maternal, the natural maternal instinct in women and the sense that in order to survive, we must be united. Yes, uh, I should mention that in our production, uh, Lena and Ruth, our mother and daughter in real life. And Travis was the third generation of that family. So three generations of one family on the civic stage, priceless moment, memorable moment. Let's talk a little bit about Lena and, and why maybe that unity is so important within the context of history. If Lena's 60-ish in 1959, what is it about her life that makes that so crucial for this unity to be present and prevalent in the lives of a younger family. Why does that have to be? Laura. And for the women, um, she was actually forced to have children um, not with the man that they loved mm -hmm. necessarily mm -hmm. at all. Um, and so to fast forward to Lena's family, to be able to see her children stay together in their household and to grow into the people that they are capable of becoming and to reach their potential, that is, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's her mother's dream is for her, her children to be everything they can be. And, yeah. um, and to stay together um, was is also inherent in that dream because that's what someone else said about United We Stand is that togetherness will um, support one another and <coughs> celebrate one another and lift each other up and that's where the strength comes from. Yes, that's exactly what I was getting at, slavery in which your family could be sold away from you at any moment. And there was no reproof. I mean, you could do nothing about that. So that's a very real thing for a woman like Lena who can reach back and touch slavery, who can reach back and touch sharecropping. That's a huge deal for her to keep her family, to maintain the family. But within that, we get into this intergenerational almost power struggle because who now is the man of the house technically? Well, there's only one left, and it's Walter Lee, the, the junior. However, with slavery and sharecropping and, and reconstruction, all that, that period in our nation's history, with that in mind, women, Black women in particular, had to assume the responsibility as the head of the household. 
when these families were ripped apart. Yeah. And this is also where the importance of the extended family comes, right? Because you, you make family with who you have left. So that's what Lena is able to, to touch upon um, in this play that her children can't, even Ruth can't, some of these intergenerational uh, relationships. Beneatha, the script says, Lena says to her several times, you know, you're something new. Your father and I never even considered some of the stuff that you and Walter Lee are talking about. What's the deal with Beneatha? Why is she so starkly different from her mother, from her parents? What is it about that character? Don't worry, my students are silent all the time. So I've grown accustomed to <laughs> waiting for a response. What is it about Beneatha? What, what's the change? Wherein lies the change from Lena's generation to, to Beneatha's? Mm-hmm. Yes. An education, I believe, is what marks that difference. Lena is not educated formally. Walter, it doesn't appear, is formally he didn't attend college. Ruth, it's implied in the script, did not attend college. So Beneatha stands out as this odd ball because education makes the difference. And we're talking about a black family on the south side of Chicago. She's first generation. I mean, of course she sticks out like a sore thumb. She has all these ideas. She flits, uh, the script says, from thing to thing because she just has a thirst for knowledge. She craves to learn to play the guitar, to pick up horseback riding, play acting, become a doctor. She has all these different interests because education sparks that curiosity. Whereas someone like a Ruth, who's very close to Lena, doesn't have those same ambitions because she has accepted that her role in life is different. Her role is mother and wife and domestic, much like Lena's was. Yeah. It seems like um, she's rebellious and fierce, but really she's just clinging or she's just um, hunger for this education for new experiences and whatnot. So at first, maybe she seemed a little too fierce. Uh, but then you learn more about her mm -hmm. and and see that it's more a thirst for education and a better, a, a, a different life than her, you know, parents and, and parent and brother. Yes, in a lot of ways. I mean, the theme in the subject of religion, Benita completely rejects the God of her parents. And Lena mentions in the script how, you know, her and, and Walter Sr. went through trouble to get their children to church every Sunday. And Benita says, that's something I just don't accept. Can you imagine with all that history of Lena and the sharecropping and the slavery and the keeping the family together to have this new breed say, uh, I reject that. Talk about timelessness. Yeah, still, still very relevant, still very prevalent today. Okay, let's get into some other things. I wanna cut Mary loose, but I wanna just kind of wrap up here about the, the play itself. A Raising the Sun has been around since 1959. How many years is that? It's a long time. <laughs> when Clybourne Park premiered in 2009, I believe that was the 50th uh, anniversary. And, and what we've had is this collaboration, which was the brainchild of uh, Laura Zervik. She, wants, she wanted to do both pieces simultaneously, but ultimately it's ended up that we're doing them back to back. So you get the story of Raisin and this black family moving into Clybourne Park, which is an all white area. And Carl Lindner, Ron's character coming to them and saying, hey, are you sure you wanna do this? We will give you a financial lump sum. We will overpay you to not come out here. So then Bruce Norris takes that story and he extrapolates a bit on it. And it was a highly decorated play when it premiered. It won the Tony for uh, best play that year. 
One of the things that I did not know about A Raisin in the Sun is, yes, Lorraine was the first Black woman to have her play produced on Broadway, but at the time, she was the youngest playwright to win the Drama Critics Circle Award, I believe. And that's not something that I knew until we were working on this production. So with both Raisin and Clyborne, you have this wealth of history. Um, and the South Side of Chicago is an arsenal and a wealth of history. And Mary Redmond is from that area. And I would like her to uh, just talk a little bit about the production that's happening right now on the civic stage and the correlation between A Raisin in the Sun and Clyborne Park, just for a few moments. Mary Redmond. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Clyborne Park was written by a a company member of Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago. And what you find out in the first act of Clyborne Park is how the Youngers, the reasons why the Younger family was able to buy the house they bought. And that tells the story of a white family that has lost a son to suicide and therefore the house when they decide to get out. Um, their son, Kenneth, was a Korean war hero when he came home. And then they found out that Carl was part of a unit that in the Korean War committed an atrocity somewhat akin to the Meili massacre in Vietnam, where they went into, they were told to secure the village, they go in, they wind up killing civilians, which used to be verboten, right? And we know that's gone right out the window with Ukraine. They're targeting civilians now, but I digress. So you find out, it talks about the sense of community and why this particular family feels that they are no longer accepted by the community because of the allegations against their son. And the son fully admits that he, he and his unit did this massacre. But in the course of his admitting it, he cannot find a job in his hometown. His parents are ostracized. And eventually, he winds up taking his own life. It's set in 1959, just as the Youngers are moving. The second act is about Carl Lindner again, and um, but this time he's portrayed as um, Carl is that the, the cast flips. You have 1959, and now it's 2009 in the second act. You have a 50 year arc where this neighborhood has gone from an all white neighborhood to an all black neighborhood and therefore was termed as ghetto, but they're five minutes outside the Chicago Loop, where most people work in the city of Chicago. And so they, you have what we call dinks, dual income, no kids, right? They come in and they start buying these properties, many of which are dilapidated, and instead of honoring the history of the fact that there were cross burnings. There were rocks thrown through the windows of black families. In Chicago, they might burn down your garage in the middle of the night. They've never attempt, I, to my knowledge, they'd never attempt to set the, the house on fire, but they'd either tag, which means graffiti spray paint, the garages or the house or their cars. They'd throw rocks through the window with a note wrapped around them saying, get the hell out of here. Um, anyway, the neighborhood is being regentrified, which basically means that they're trying to put a mix of the races back into the neighborhood. And one of the things that the character in the second act, Lena, talks about is the political initiative to change the face of a neighborhood that has close proximity 
to downtown. And therefore, these houses that were part of part of the reason that Dr. Martin Luther King came specifically to the city of Chicago when he started his movement. And what Lena talks about is the new neighbors, the white neighbors that, that bought the house that she basically grew up in, want to tear down the house. Everybody that's coming in is tearing down these old Chicago bungalows and putting up mega mansions on lots that are too small for the house. And Lena gives a very impassioned speech. And the character of Lena in the second act is actually the great niece of Lena from Raisin in the Sun. And she talks about the fact that once we forget our history, we're doomed. You cannot ignore what has happened between races, between genders, between those that have and those that have nothing. That we need to honor the struggle that despite rocks through the window, despite burning crosses, despite living in fear, probably to go out of the house in in daylight, because who knows, they may be attacked. She talks about the fact that we must honor the history of the struggle that these first black families that move into an all white neighborhood go through and how it affects their children, how it affects their family situation. And ultimately all she asks is for the neighbors to respect the history of the house and to possibly just leave the structure but redo the inside. But the structure, the structure has a soul because it's the same house that our first act characters lost their son in and it's the same house that the second act characters are trying to tear down. Um, so I think it, it gives a nice arc to the fact that over the 50 years, the black family have traveled. They've gone to Europe. They've, they're both employed. They're successful people. They want to stay in the neighborhood. They're happy to live alongside a white family. They would be happy with it. Their issue is that the white family wants to tear down the house that they live next door to and put up a house that is 15 feet, three inches taller than any other house in this 12 block radius of the neighborhood. And this is what the black family objects to, which is exactly the opposite of what the white family in the first act who are approached to by Carl Linder to sell their house to the community association so we can keep it pure. So that's basically, I, I hope I made some sense with this. It, the thing that intrigued me and the reason that I wanted to, I asked Tony about um, directing the play. I do not have the credentials that this young man has when it comes to theater. All I have is a lot of experience. And I've award-winning actress. Well, <laughs> I've got some credentials, but I do what I love. I'm yeah. in a position to do what I love. Um, what's interesting to me also about the way Bruce Norris wrote this play, we've all heard racist jokes, have we not? We've all heard, and usually they're quite derogatory, right? Well, that kind of happens in the second act here, where they the, the white man who wants to tear down the house and the black man that's trying to not get him to tear down the house have a whole series of interchanges with jokes. For example, if I may tell one, after the white man tells a, a very disgusting, um, I forget what she says about the most horrible stereotypes. 
the black man comes back and he says, okay, Steve, how many white men does it take to screw in a light bulb? And Steve said, I'll play along. I can do this all night. How many white men does it take to screw in a light bulb? And Kevin, the black man says, all of them. Why is that? One to hold the bulb while the rest of them screw the entire world. And then they start to talk a little bit about the issues of how women are the victims of a white male myopia. <laughs> I mean, again, both of these plays, Lorraine's play touches on her experience, and both of these plays wrap around Raisin in the Sun, but it also talks about this, everything is in flux. Everything is changing at every second. But sometimes that change takes 50 years. Sometimes it takes 100 years. But it's always moving. And I think the play gives you some hope that eventually we will not see each other simply in terms of color because color tells you nothing. Color, color is for nature. It's not for human beings. And the fact of the matter is that love, kindness, courtesy, respect, and that old adage of treating everyone you meet the way you wish to be treated. It's so simple, we can't seem to get it. So that's all I have to say. I go on and on. <laughs> Mary Redmond is a multi-award winning actress out of Chicago. Uh, what is it, Mary Jeff Award you've won? Oh, OB? I mean, she's, she's amazing, and it's been really nice to have her. So Clyburn Park runs one more weekend. This weekend, yes. and it closes Sunday. Yes. If you have not joined us thus far, please do join us because although it is not a sequel to Raisin in the Sun, it is a continuation. It's, it's really about the story of the house and the neighborhood and exactly what, what Mary was getting at and how lucky are we to have someone whose roots are right there, south side of Chicago. So thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. So let's talk a little bit about the movie because most people are familiar with this story from the 1961 film. How many of you have seen it? How many of you, that was your introduction to A Raisin in the Sun as opposed to the play? Aha, uh -huh. what was it like experiencing that movie in real time? Can you remember how old you were, where you were, who you were with, what was happening in 1961? Anyone briefly can speak to the experience of Sidney Poitier, Ruby Dee, Claudia McNeil, that movie when it premiered. Who remembers that time? Mary, the gentleman in the back. Mm -hmm. What was your response to it? What did you think of the story unfolding in front of you? Fair enough. Who remembers a little bit that they can share? And then we'll get, we'll get Mary's take on it as well. Oh, come on. It's a classic film. Ron, what was your first take? Well, I was in junior civics, so I was already immersed in being on stage. And uh, when I saw the play, I thought to myself, I mean, when I saw the movie, I thought to myself, this Sidney Poitier is like a black Lawrence Olivier. And he was, he was a spectacular actor. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that show, when I saw that movie, it was just, I think it was one of the, the major points in my life where I started to separate from my parents because they had been brought up in a different time. They thought about race differently than I did. Mm -hmm. 
they tried to make me think about race the same way they did, mm -hmm. but I experienced it in another way because I was in the theater. Yes. And there were black kids in the theater, and I said, they're no different than me. They're just like me. Yeah, what a concept. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Other things about the 61 film. I mean, it's extremely famous. Some people don't even know that this is a play. They just think they made a movie. It starred Sidney Poitier. Anyone see the 2008 update of the, yes, <laughs> the young person in the room. <laughs> Your take on that? Oh, thank you. Um, I really loved it. And I, I loved the casting. I'd be curious to know how you uh, managed to pull that cast together. It was wonderful. Um, they they embodied the, the characters mm -hmm. so much, and I could feel the family and all of their struggle. So the 2008 version, for my taste, spoon fed too much. <laughs> I didn't need all the extra scenes in between telling me what was going on. Yeah, just my take. That's one of the things about film adaptations yeah. and kind of how it takes away from being in that cramped apartment for those Correct. three hours. And I, I felt I needed that for what what the what the show was. I wanted them in that apartment the mm -hmm. entire time. Mm -hmm. It makes a difference. Yep. You're saying all the right things. This is the stuff I was imparting to my cast. Okay. The audience has to feel the crampedness. So when Walter had that meltdown, I'm right there with him. Yes. I yes. We're glad you're here and thank you for those words. Let's talk a little bit about the production. Casting it was it was easy and it was hard, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I wondered where you got everything from. Like I said, stay at all moms, so hey, talk to you know that. <laughs> We're very lucky to have um, community actors such as Xavier Bolden who was last seen before Raisin at K College as the title role in Othello. Uh, Xavier was also in the piano lesson last year. So Xavier is one of the consummate performers that we have around. I'm very grateful for his work on this show. Walter Lee is a hard role and I attend every performance. So I would sit back there on that bench and I would soak up the reactions from everyone, every single show, and people just disliked him right off because of the way he came off immediately in the morning with his wife and then with the sister and then the interactions with the mother. So it's hard to like him, some would say. But again, with context, with social, historical, political context, can you fault the guy for feeling like Yes. And literally in that apartment with women who don't quite understand what he feels that his role as the man, the new man of the house, now that his father's deceased, there's this intergenerational, but not even because it's with his mother, but it's also with his wife and it's also with his sister. So we have the intergenerational dynamic. We have the gender dynamics. We have power dynamics with these, um, this family, the younger family. So I was lucky to have Xavier. Uh, I had a, a student from Western, Sierra Hedgepeth, who was a beautiful Benita. Um, that was played by Jen, Jennifer Hebben when I saw it at the parish in 2004. And I remember that role really sticking out, maybe because of the education. I'm not sure. But that role, that's a tough, tough one to nail. And I think Sierra definitely nailed it. Again, we have the pastor, the pastor's daughter, and the grandson as Lena, Ruth, and Travis, which was amazing. And uh, the rest of the cast was rounded out by people who don't do theater every day, who maybe didn't go to school to do it, who maybe had never done it before. And that's one of the most rewarding parts of working at the Civic, working in community theater, is we get to tackle this rough and rugged piece with people who don't always know the rules, which is great, because when you don't know the rules, you're not afraid of breaking any. And so I get real authentic reactions from them, and that's what I wanted. I wanted the feeling 
to come across. So any audience member who walks out saying, I felt we've done our job. So thank you, thank you for that. Other things about, other questions about the, the production that just closed on the 22nd of January. Mary. I don't have a question necessarily. I wanna know how you feel about the fact that we struggled to replace Steve Ware in our shows and that between Black History Month and Dr. King's anniversary, how many Black actors are employed in Kalamazoo at this moment? This is true. Uh, there was a lot happening at one time. Western was presenting a collaboration with Face Off, Dontrell Who Kissed the Sea, we were presenting A Raisin in the Sun. There were actors in Clybourne Park. There was a lot of stuff happening. And so we did not have a surplus of black talent um, to draw from. How I feel overall is that there is a surplus of black talent in Kalamazoo that is yet untapped. And that is part of my mission in this new, new job is to tap into that because I'm a product of this community. So there's no reason that there are not other little Anthony J's out there waiting to come and have an art break conversation with you all in the future. My beginning with A Raisin in the Sun started at the Civic. So there's a lot of untapped potential, a lot of untapped talent in this community. And I think hopefully there's a scenario in which we don't have to work as hard to find a replacement if we need one. Yeah. Other things about a raisin in the sun, its legacy, its timelessness. Yes, sir. My wife and I are both politically active. And we've made clear to you know, the carpenters and anyone who's listening is that I'm glad the Civic is doing things that are now more socially active. A common complaint I've had with Civic Productions and some other productions is okay, yeah, another production of Pokemon Oma. Yes. Or, yeah. Come on. Something <laughs> modern, like Grayson. Yes. Poke and Pride Orange. And, you know, every season, put in a few socially, things are trying to say something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Laura. Laura's directing a production <laughs> entitled First Date, which is very <laughs> contemporary. Uh, I won't put Laura on the spot, but <laughs> if you would like to share. Presenting, we're not afraid to present things we make. Yeah. That's the direction we're moving into. Now, we need to probably rub the hall with them now and then. Well, it's, but, yes. so we're really peppered with those pieces. I'm not, I, I don't want to shy away from things that are going to make people angry. Yes. Our common models, like at Stratford, they have every, every season, we have, they do 20 plays. You have a handful of Shakespeare you have to. You have Oklahoma, Rise of Dolls. <laughs> yes. But then you also have, in the smaller theaters, you know, the plays where you're allowed to swear. In fact, on uh, Clyborn, mm -hmm. swearing on the main stage. Mm -hmm. It's like human beings are talking, yes. Yeah. And both for whatever social thing you're trying to address because the United States has its, has its issues. And I'm just glad the Civic is making a step. Yes, lots of steps. More to come. Lanny. Was, was, was Lorraine 28 when this was written? Was that how? Written, produced, yes. So, you know, the fact, that another extraordinary fact about Raisin it won a Pulitzer. It's a Pulitzer Prize winning play mm -hmm. written by a 28 year old woman. Mm -hmm. And it went to Broadway and was directed by Lori Richards. I mean, that just the, the, the just, just the, the legacy and how the, the arc of that scene has continued forward. Uh, still, still, still producing food. Yes. Right. Still producing food. I mean, it's, 
it's really extraordinary. And I do want to circle back to this book because that is amazing. And when you see that on paper and you get the facts of the first black woman and all the awards it won, it is amazing. But when you start to read about her life, you realize that it was the expectation that she be great. It was not, she was not the exception. It was expected of her. And she talked, she's very, well, Imani Perry is the one who, who wrote this book, but Lorraine was very candid about how she felt that her parents were sometimes emotionally cold, but what they instilled in her was this race woman mentality, uplift the race, if you will. And so she, she really grabbed onto that, but she didn't come in her words from a family of people who coddled her. The expectation was that she would represent her family and Black people overall with greatness, with excellence. So I do recommend looking for Lorraine. Ron. In that same vein, could you talk for a moment about which character in Raising the Sun Lorraine liked the most, felt the most, was the most important character in, in the show? Yeah, well, Benita is a bit autobiographical, um, I would say. She did speak in interview, and you can YouTube a bunch of interviews. Uh, Lorraine, she was a revolutionary. She speaks like one. But she speaks to how Benita, in a lot of ways, elements of herself and what she experienced. There's a story, quickly, in this book about, because her family, she came from the Black middle class, if you will. And her parents sent her to school in a white fur coat. I think it was made of a rabbit or something. And she says the taunting she received from her classmates, how dare you walk into the school with that on? She, she was an other because of financial security, a sense of wealth that her, her classmates didn't have. So for her to walk in in that rabbit fur was a statement. And I believe this was an elementary school it's so interesting that kids even that young could be aware of that, could feel that. So I recommend this book highly. Is that Milan back there? Hey, hey, shout out to Milan, a K College student, award-winning artist herself. Hello. <laughs> okay, we are, we are wrapping up here. Any final questions, thoughts? I told you this was gonna be a conversation because good art should ebb and flow. It should call and respond and not just punch you over the head with whatever message. Yes, Laura and then Mary. Yes, for those of you who saw the production, I one of the things I have to say, the civic staff, they do all the legwork. They present a, a design to you. They work so hard. And so I didn't have to have a lot of input on the design process. But the one thing that I said has to be there and has to be prevalent is the portrait of the father. Because we cannot have this play. We cannot exist in this world and not have the father front and center. And this loss is recent. She's getting the insurance check. So that lets you know that it has not been years and years since he's passed. It's maybe been months. So we needed to feel the freshness of his loss, but yet still feel the presence that I think the, the portrait invoked of the presence. And that's why there were always specials on, on the father, because he was there. And then the ending moment when Lena sings to him almost in a, a praise uh, for her son having come into manhood. That's a moment I thought she needs to share with her husband and the portraits there. Let's do something cool with it. So that was the thinking behind it. Daddy was still present. Mary. The only thing I was going to say is that it makes my heart happy for Clyde One Park to see so many black and white people coming into the theater to experience the show and Discussions start as soon as the curtain goes down for intermission. Mm -hmm. And there are really some wonderful discussions going on. Yes. Yeah. And that I think that was the objective yeah. of what Laura wanted to, to get across. Have these pieces live and exist together and let's start a conversation. Yeah. And not just start it, but let's maintain it. Let's keep it going. Mm -hmm. 
All right, I will close. I want to address the dialogue that was had about the direction the Civic is going in closing. It is so important for me because I started at the Civic at 10 years old and I started doing the Oklahomas, the Camelots, the Anything Goes. It's, I, that's what, I, what got me into theater. And then when I found this, I had already gained so much information, so much training, so much knowledge from the classics that I was able to approach this with a different tenacity. When I found August Wilson, I brought all that tenacity from the Oklahomas into this newfound. So I think there's space for both and I think we're actively making space and I would like for you to, to continue to watch out for what's next. All right, anything else in closing? Thank you so much for your time.